Laguerre, who is uh, going to talk about the evolution and progeny of cultural learning. She comes from UT Austin. Next week we'll have Claudia Valeja from Yale who studies life history and other transitions among the form of Argentina. And the week after that we have a primatologist, Anita Stone, talking about uh, squirrel monkeys from juvenile to adults, life history challenges and strategies of squirrel monkeys living in eastern Amazonia, Brazil. Uh, I see a few new faces. I just want to remind you that this group meets every Monday from noon to uh, 1.30. And um, you're welcome to partake of food. Just put in $6 into the kitty. And please do sign in. Uh, that helps us make a case to the dean for continuing these, these, uh, this, this series. Um, Okay. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, I've I've long been coveting an invitation to speak with this group. So, yay! Finally, my my um, wish has been granted. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with my work, I'm a, a cognitive developmental scientist and I take an evolutionary perspective in, in understanding uh, cultural learning uh, in cumulative culture more generally. And today I want to talk to you about a, a number of different lines of research that I'm all, I'm kind of putting together with, under the umbrella of the evolution and ontogeny of cultural learning, which can mean lots of different things. So I'll, I'll give you a sense of how I've interpreted the evolution and ontogeny of, of cultural learning. So humans are easily the most cultural of all animals. I think examining the capacity for culture requires understanding the differences between humans and non-human social learning capacities, the ontogeny of those capacities, which I'm especially interested in, and, the exp and their expression between diverse human populations. So I think only the combination of these perspectives will enable us to fully understand the roots of human culture, which is ultimately what I would like to do, uh, understand uh, what makes us cultural as animals. And in the lecture today, I'm going to describe my triadic approach to understanding the evolution and ontogeny of cultural learning um, by integrating developmental, comparative, uh, and cross-cultural psychological research. The comparative piece is a new acquisition in my repertoire, but something I'm very excited about and I'm hoping for feedback from all of you on that. So our large brains aside, how does human cognition differ from other primates? One contender for explaining cross-species variation, not the only contender, but one contender, uh, in cross-species variation in cognition are the mechanisms by which humans acquire culture, our social cognition. So our prolonged early development also sets humans apart from other primates. As an altricial species, our offspring are dependent um, upon adults for survival for a very long period of time. And this extended juvenile period increases opportunities for interaction with caregivers um, and enables extensive amount of social learning. So we know that young children are psychologically prepared to learn from others. Young children, like um, those you see pictured here, these are all um, children that live in, in Tana Vanuatu, which is one of the places I, uh, my students and I conduct our research. They're heavily and highly adept at acquiring the beliefs and practices of whatever human group they're born into. Um, so this is one extraordinary thing about, about human children, their enormous flexibility, adaptability, and their capacity to acquire the beliefs and practices of whatever group they're born into. So if you're born, into, um, born in a village in Tana Vanuatu, you learn all about gardening and agriculture and all the different subsistence practices that are required in that context. If you're a male child, you learn about fishing. Um, you learn about constructing homes. If you're um, a female child, you learn about um, agriculture and food preparation and child care. Um, the point is that we are fully equipped to acquire whatever practices of the groups we're born into. And I think that's an extraordinary learning achievement. Um, it requires a lot of, of flexibility. And I suppose at, at its core, it's what I'm most interested in trying to understand. So I'll start out with a, a definition of culture, knowing full well that there are many people who spend their, much of their careers trying to understand how to define and study human culture. Here I'm 
pulling from a um, the comparative literature to define culture as group typical behaviors shared by members of a community that rely on socially learned and transmitted information. Now, in the case of human culture, that would also include um, practices, values, institutions. Um, that's how I'm defining culture. I think cultural variability is one of our species' most distinctive and interesting features. So human cross-cultural variation is unique in both its extent and also, obviously, its structural complexity. We display a wider repertoire of socially acquired and transmitted behaviors that vary more across groups than any other animal. So rather than, um, than view cultural variability as a sort of noisy, um, distraction that is um, obscuring our understanding of human universality. universality, I think cultural variability is, is where all the most interesting answers to human social cognition lie. Now, if social learning explains cultural transmission, which obviously it does at some level, the psychological mechanisms, at least at some level, must be um, universal. Right? So things like teaching in a, in a kind of fundamental way or imitation are uniquely human capacities. But these social learning mechanisms need to be responsive to diverse ontogenetic contexts and cultural ecologies. So there's a lot of interest in trying to understand whether teaching is, is uniquely human or not, or whether imitation is uniquely human or not. Uh, and I, I think those questions are interesting. I'm much more interested in how variable um, cultural transmission practices like teaching and cultural acquisition practices like imitation are. So I'm, I'm interested in their flexibility and their diversity, not just whether they're universal or not, because I think there's a lot of evidence, at least at some level, they are. So how is culture acquired on the part of, of um, children? We know that children possess cognitive and communication systems that have evolved to acquire complex technical and social skills. There's vast developmental literature documenting this. Children are also uniquely attentive to social input and learn through observation. Um, in fact, in most human cultures, children are believed to be perfectly capable of self-education almost exclusively through observation. Um, and over the course of human history, a large portion of the skills that we need to have in our repertoire could be learned through observation. I think that's increasingly um, less the case, for example, with numeracy and, li and literacy and lots of other complex skills, uh, teaching is probably um, required. Um, That's probably how teaching evolved or why teaching evolved. It, it enables the efficient transfer of information. Uh, teaching is, of course, not just one thing. We often think about teaching in the West as didactic pedagogy or direct active instruction, and that's clearly a type of teaching. But there are lots of other ways that you can teach. Think through things like opportu opportunity provisioning. Um, teaching is a very variable category of cultural transmission. We also know the capacity to imitate others is integral to the development of human cultural learning. A huge portion of what children learn, they learn through imitation. So I'm going to be talking quite a bit about both teaching as a cultural transmission practice and imitation as a cultural acquisition strategy. Really what I want to understand is variation in social learning. So that's what I'm going to talk with you um, about today. Examining the, the flexibility and diversity of cultural uh, transmission practices and acquisition strategies, I think, provides insight into the evolution and ontogeny of human culture, which is my big picture takeaway message. So I'm, I'm stating this now in the hopes that you will agree at the end of the talk that I have convinced you that this is indeed true. So what kinds of socialization practices and learning strategies would you expect in a social group living primate species with an extended juvenile period and highly sophisticated social cognition? I think you would expect teaching. Um, and I'm talk quite a bit about how sophisticated teaching is as a social learning practice. Uh, it requires perspective taking on the part of the teacher and the learner. So I'm interested in whether teaching is an adaptation for human cultural transmission. Um, to under, try to understand this, you need to look at cultural variation in teaching. Um, I'm also really interested in how formal education changes how caregivers educate their children. Um, there's some very interesting work by people like Susanna Gaskins and Barbara Rogoff and others that um, has uh, suggested that formal education not only 
impacts children's cognition for obvious reasons, but it also impacts the ways that uh, the ways that people educate their children, the way that they control their attention, the way in which they transmit information. So I'll talk a bit about that um, in my lecture today. We also know that children are very precocious imitators. Uh, I'm interested in whether high fidelity copying is an adaptation that provides a psychological foundation for cultural transmission. Um, I'm interested in the function of imitation, or in fact, the multifunctionality of imitation. Children imitate for lots of different reasons, and I'll talk more about that um, in uh, the latter part of my talk. I'm also interested in behavioral flexibility. I'm doing this in a comparative project, and whether uh, behavioral flexibility can explain differences in the complexity of human versus chimpanzee culture. So using examples of evidence from research I've conducted on teaching and imitation, what I'm hoping to do is highlight how um, comparative and cross-cultural research enriches our understanding of human development more broadly, um, and in particular leads to deeper understanding of the evolution of the uniquely um, human cultural mind. Um, also talk a little bit about the affiliative motivation to engage in imitation uh, and how that links up with ritual psychology, which is something I've become quite fascinated by in, in recent years. Uh, it's kind of interesting how uh, discipline, different divisions between disciplines shape the sorts of topics that are studied. I mean, ritual is something that has been um, extensively studied within anthropology. Um, and up until very, very recently has been ent almost entirely absent in the psychological literature. Even though I would argue that ritual is a fundamental feature of human social cognition and behavior and is probably uniquely human. Fascinating that psychologists would have, um, would have omitted that from their topics of study. So let's talk a bit about teaching first and critically cultural variation in teaching. So there's a, a very large literature in developmental psychology on early teaching and early social learning. So if you were to look into the developmental literature on what to expect in terms of early infant uh, parent interaction, you'd see a lot of focus on joint attention, which has been characterized as face-to-face -face visual communication and mutual eye gaze. A lot of the research on this particular topic is with Western um, educated industrialized populations. The modality of the interaction tends to be very heavily visual um, and vocal or verbal. Lots of emphasis in the developmental literature on how important pedagogy is. Um, uh, there's a literature on what's been termed natural pedagogy, which focuses a lot on ostensive or communicative signals on the part of the caregiver. Uh, a lot of emphasis on pointing and alternating gaze. Uh, and lots of emphasis on direct instruction. So if you were to, to open up the empirical literature, empirical experimental psychology literature and development, this is what you would expect um, te early teaching to look like. Um, so actually, lots of interest in things like um, joint attention and direct instruction as being candidates for human universals and as kind of species specific. Now, this is obviously interesting and important for lots of different reasons, but there's lots of, I, I suppose, reason to think that these are, um, both of these different things are mechanisms for cultural transmission um, and acquisition. Now, if you look into the ethnographic literature on childhood, not that there is a large literature on the ethnography of childhood, but there's, there's quite a bit of, of very interesting work. Um, and this is where you would expect cultural variation. I mean, keep in mind the developmental literature is relatively little information about cultural variation, generally speaking. But if you look at eth ethnographies, this is where you would expect variation. Physical proximity. Right? So we know that children, there's enormous variation in how much physical contact um, occurs between parents and their, um, and their offspring and their children. Tactile feedback varies enormously. Um, you think about how, how child rearing environments have changed in the West just within the past couple of decades. Um, I'm doing a lot of research now in Bolivia and Guatemala looking at how um, variation in the amount of physical contact between um, infants and their, and their caregivers has a whole cascade of psychological consequences. I and mean, you think about how, how we transport babies in the West, it's often in these kind of external baby buckets um, that forcibly separate uh, 
infants from their caregivers. We know fairly little what the, you know, about the psychological or even physiological consequences of, being, um, of not being in direct physical contact with our, um, with our babies. We also know there's massive variation in the amount of direct speech um, or speech that is directed to infants. All of these things should impact early teaching. There's variation in, in the style of teaching and social learning. Um, also, the emphasis on self-education or observation. So in the, the, um, uh, in the villages that I work on, um, work at in Tana, when I ask caregivers about how children learn, um, they'll say things like they learn by watching, they learn through observation, uh, which sounds completely reasonable. Um, except when you ask Western, middle class, your American parents about this and uh, ask them how, they, how children learn, they say things like, well, they have to be taught. They learn through instruction. They learn through, uh, through teaching. So beliefs about like, parental ethno theories of how children learn have a dramatic impact on, um, on teaching as well, or the style of teaching. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of, of reason to believe that exposure to formal education affects socialization and social learning. Um, educational institutions are not content and culture free. They carry with them and bring with them many, many, many different expectations for social interaction um, and how to manage attention, things like turn taking. There's a whole cascade of different social learning that occurs in the context of formal education that has very little to do with the particular educational content. And as I'm sure many of you realize, cultural contexts that are most widely studied, again, within experimental psychology, are um, increasingly unrepresentative of human social cognition globally and historically. Um, we actually just had a paper accepted, a review paper, uh, we had it accepted last night, uh, it was actually the most difficult paper I've ever had um, to publish. And all this paper is, is just documenting the population studied in major, the highest impact developmental psychological journals. So we just reviewed the, um, the highest impact factor journals, child development, developmental psychology, and developmental science from the past four or five years and looked at the populations studied in those journals, like where, where in the world they come from. And we found is that less than 7% of the papers come from or study populations in the entirety of Africa, all of Asia, all of South America, Latin America, and Melanesia. Less than 7% of the papers. Um, I felt compelled to do this because when often when I present cross-cultural research to psychological audiences, I'll often get the feedback that, oh, this is really great that you're doing this. I'm so glad we finally took care of this issue as a field. <laughs> so we haven't <laughs> taken care of this. Um, I cannot single-handedly, like Clark and I cannot single-handedly do all of this. Um, we need to have more people taking this sort of thing. Um, seriously. Um, and psychologists respond to numbers, so we just counted the populations up and hopefully they'll be convinced and, um, and compelled to address this. So my research is carried out in multiple child rearing environments in the United States, in Austin, the weirdest of all weird cities, um, and in Tana Vanuatu, which Vanuatu, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, it's a Melanesian island nation. It's um, in the South Pacific. It's one of the most remote, culturally and, ling and linguistically diverse, understudied contexts or countries in the world. Although there have been some recent, um, a number of, of labs who've started studying Vanuatu. So it will no longer be the most understudied um, for long, which I suppose is, is great. Uh, it's famous in linguistic anthropology circles because of the enormous linguistic diversity um, here. The reason that there hasn't been more contact with industrialized um, countries, colonial powers, is because there aren't easily extractable mineral resources in Vanuatu. So unlike PNG, the country has been left, relatively speaking, um, untouched, at least in, in um, a large portion or large number of the, the islands. So a little bit more about Vanuatu before I talk about our research there. It's primarily rural. Um, a large portion of the population is living according to ancestrally enjoined ways of life. So they're living using traditional practices. They engage in subsistence agriculture almost exclusively. Uh, fertility is quite high. There have been very effective campaigns to reduce the um, transmission of 
uh, infectious disease in Vanuatu, so that has reduced infant mortality quite a bit. And because there's high levels of physical activity and very healthy pesticide-free organic diets, largely vegetarian, chronic disease is very, very low there. Um, uh, the primary reason I work there is that a lot of the children are not um, attending Western-style schools. They're not in formal schools. Less than 10% attend secondary school. A larger portion attend primary school, but I can still find um, you know, relatively large number of children who have never been to school at all and have parents who have never been to school at all. If you want to understand the impact of formal education on cognitive and social developmental outcomes, you need to study populations that haven't all been to Western-style schools. Uh, we only have, I would say, a decade, um, another decade to try to study this. Uh, every time I go back to Vanuatu, more and more and more of the children are, are at attending schools. So um, one, of my, uh, one of the current projects that I'm working on is looking at um, collecting data on cognitive and social developmental outcomes with unschooled populations working in Vanuatu, but also in Bolivia and Namibia. Children in these contexts, like villages in Tana, are useful. They engage in lots of subsistence tasks and caregiving. They do things that are actually relevant to the outcomes and well-being of the family. Um, they don't, they're not segregated from adult activity in the way that we segregate children um, in, in our context. And as I mentioned, there's high levels of diversity. So what I'm going to talk about today is a far cultural comparison. So the US, Austin, Texas, and town of Vanuatu differ in lots of different ways. Um, but my primary interest in trying to understand child rearing in Vanuatu is really about trying to, ca to characterize a, um, the diversity of global child rearing practices, um, not necessarily to identify um, the one variable that explains all of these differences, because as I mentioned, they differ in multiple ways. They differ in terms of the, the style of the economy, Vanuatu's subsistence agricultural context. Education is um, informal, based on an apprenticeship model in Vanuatu. In the US, obviously more formal. Uh, the cultural values concerning uh, conformity versus autonomy or creativity are very, very different, and I'm going to give you some evidence for this. Child rearing is very different in ever so many ways. Um, one, one way to characterize it is more child-centered um, in the US and more adult-centered in Vanuatu. And this is not about the degree to which children are valued. They are valued in both contexts. Um, but I, when I think about child-centered um, child rearing, uh, one of the, the, I think one of the ways you can tell whether you have a child-centered household, which most of you probably do, whether you know it or not, but you can tell um, if you make special meals for your children that you don't eat, child-centered. If you are an unpaid employee of your child, child-centered. <laughs> Caregiver pedagogical style, as I mentioned before, much more focused on observational learning in Vanuatu and much more emphasis on didactic pedagogy. Um, we've done quite a few studies looking at parental, what we call eth ethno theories, actually. Uh, Heidi Keller, I think, is the one who might have coined that term. Uh, it's just how parents think about children's learning. They emphasize um, direct instruction much more in the US and observation much more in Vanuatu. So the first empirical study I want to talk to you about, very simple study, observational study using a constrained task, semi-structured task, I should say, on parent-infant interaction in the US and in Vanuatu. And we're interested in the modality of triadic interaction. So this is, this is a study with a um, caregiver, typically the mother, and her infant and a novel object. So object, infant, parent, triadic interaction. We were interested in, um, by modality, I'm referring here to whether um, the kind of communication between infant and parent is more visually mediated, more vocally mediated, or um, uh, more physically mediated through physical contact or touch. And we were interested in whether um, there's variation in teaching. This paper um, recently came out in Child Development. So here's what we find. Um, just as just one more note, the physical orientation of the dyad or the triad, I suppose, was identical at least at the start of the experiment. So the mother and infant were positioned facing each other, and there was a novel object placed between them. There was no other instruction whatsoever, and we just videotaped to see what um, what happened. So what we see here is that visual triadic engagement is much more frequent in the US and in Vanuatu, which is absolutely what we predicted. Now keep in mind, the most typical 
Um, the typical thing that happened immediately after the start of the experiment in Vanuatu was for the Nivan mother, and typically the mother, to reach over and take her infant and turn her infant around and put her infant on her lap facing outward. Right? Already that's going to change your opportunities for visual eye contact and eye gaze. It's kind of interesting that that's the first thing that occurs um, in Vanuatu. That almost never happens in the US. What happens in the US is probably something that all of you could explain to me. The caregiver goes into full pedagogical mode takes the novel object and uses this as an opportunity to explain to their preverbal infant all about this particular novel object. Keep in mind, she knows nothing of this novel object, given that I just gave this to her. And yet, she still feels compelled to teach the infant about this object. Um, you'll note physical tra tragic engagement is much more common in Vanuatu. In fact, the infants are, are in direct physical contact with the, the mother for almost the entire span of the interaction. And we found relatively similar um, vocal triadic engagement, um, although that was still relatively, um, occurs at fairly low levels. And um, I'll present another study next that sh presents a bit of a different picture with older children. As a follow-up to this particular study, we had exactly the same setup. But in this case, we modeled a behavior that could be, or a particular action on that novel object um, that the mother saw outside of the visual access of the baby. And we coded to see whether the mother would spontaneously transmit or teach this action to her infant. Um, we see more of that in the US than in Vanuatu, presumably based on an expectation that the, the responsibility of the caregiver is to transmit and, t and explicitly teach information. So even very, very early in childhood, you see variation in the modality of communication and also the frequency with which information is transmitted. So I just want to say a little bit more about tactile contact. It's something I've been become extremely interested in. I mean, it's the evolutionarily oldest form of social engagement. It's characteristic, as many of you know, of most non-human caregiver uh, or primate infant caregiver um, interaction. And the emphasis in psychological theories on visual engagement um, underestimates, I think, the prevalence and importance of physical contact globally. Um, in much of the world, infants are in direct physical contact with their primary caregiver for many, 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 many hours per day um, for much of their, um, their early life. This has implications for infant feeding, for infant attachment, for joint attention, for so many, many different indicators of early social cognition. And yet we don't currently have a, a, a kind of globally informed account of the impact of, of physical contact on things like contingent responsivity, joint attention, attachment. So uh, my, my hope is that developmentalists will pay a lot more attention to this. I think one of the reasons that it's been relatively neglected is because developmental psychologists typically work in weird populations um, and weird populations that carry their babies in buckets and buckets with wheels and buckets in cars and buckets in rooms on the other side of the house. You want to avoid codependency at all costs, I suppose. OK, so the next study I want to present is similar to the, um, the parent-infant um, study that I just presented, except it's a more a slightly more complex tasks that task that is appropriate for um, slightly older children. So in this particular study, we're interested in variation in teaching style uh, and also in cooperation. Um, I don't know if you can see the gratuitous guitars on the, hanging in the walls in a children's museum in Austin. That's actually a great way, if you want to get fathers in your study, collect data at a science museum. Because for whatever reason, fathers think, are more likely to think that it's an appropriate place to interact with their children. We've had. Trying to get fathers into our lab is like pulling teeth, but they'll go to the science museum. So in this particular study, keep in mind, we're looking at variation in teaching style. So what we, in this task, we gave them a, uh, just a simple tangram task. Keep in mind, the purpose of the task was just for them to do something together, something cooperative. It's not meant to be a difficult task. And indeed, it is not a difficult task. We found no differences between these populations. This is in, in town of Vanuatu and Austin, Texas. Absolutely no difference in the, um, 
performance on the task. So any cultural variation we find is not a function of the task being more novel or unfamiliar in one context than another. So this task requires rotating these geometric objects uh, around and to cr create this larger shape. And we videotaped the entire interaction. We looked at all aspects of caregiver child behavior, scaffolding, and speech. And what I'll present next is what we found. First of all, we found that US parents talk constantly. Um, the entire, entire interaction. This is about a five minute interaction max. It's not a difficult task. In the US, there are about 12 utterances per minute. Um, these are middle class. Your American families, by and large, um, there's, as we know, well know, there's SES variation in this. There's an enormous amount of verbal output on the part of the parents. In Vanuatu, there are about 3.5 utterances per minute compared to 12. Okay, uh, massive variation in how much speech is produced. And one of the reasons that I decided to to, to sit down and and videotape and quantify all of this, um, keep in mind, is to try to convince my quantitatively oriented colleagues that they absolutely must pay attention to this. And as I say, psychologists pay attention to numbers. So look, numbers. <laughs> Statements, different, more common in the US than in Vanuatu. Also look at questions. These Nibon parents are not asking their children basically any questions at all. Right? What kinds of questions do you imagine the US caregivers are asking their children? These are five to eight year olds. In the context of a simple task like this, what sorts of things are they asking. How did you know? That's exactly right. Lots of rhetorical questions. Also a lot of questions that are about eliciting speech from the child. Right? So think about parental ethno theories of, of, of children's learning. Um, and also the, uh, a lot of the, the parenting literature has made its way into middle class parenting and there's a huge emphasis on getting children to be very verbal and to produce a lot of speech. So a lot of the questions are of that sort as well. Here, here are a few other speech categories. Planning, lots of planning in the US. Let's put the objects here, then let's do this, then let's do that. So a lot of that. A big por portion of formal education is oriented towards planning. Right? I'm pretty sure that's the primary reason to go to school is to learn a bit about planning. Not that we're ever even very good at it, despite many years of training. But I think that's the goal. And parents put a lot of emphasis on that. Look at praise. A lot of praise. Three utterances per minute. That's on a task that is not rocket science, right? This is just moving shapes around. Lots of you're awesome. Um, I got a few, you're amazing. Um, you're so good at this. And you gotta wonder what is, where, like culturally, where did this come from? Right? Maybe this is another ethno theory of children's learning that they need a lot of praise in order to stay motivated, in order to feel good about themselves. Um, but kind of astonishing. That I mean, maybe none of you are astonished by this, but I think my developmental colleagues are astonished by this. Uh, correction, a bit more common in Vanuatu. Uh, this would be verbal correction. And instruction, pretty much, pretty similar. Like instruction is the primary vocal, or sorry, verbal output on the part of Nivon um, caregivers. Right? So massive variation in um, many, many, many different aspects of speech. So just a few take home messages um, to kind of characterize cultural variation in teaching style. US caregivers rely on tons of verbal communication. I would say gratuitous communication in many cases. They're, they're communicating a lot more than just information about the task. They're scaffolding through language. There's lots of questions, planning, praise. US children also use more language relative to Nivon children who use very, very little indeed. Um, they engage in much more overall behavior. So to kind of characterize what US children are doing in this context, or US children and their parents are doing, the caregiver is kind of in the wings and doing lots of verbal instruction in the background. But the child is doing almost all the actual um, target actions. In, in Vanuatu, the caregivers are using touch and context. They're scaffolding through correction. Children are using much more nonverbal communication than the US kids. They're also using more gesture, more physical touch, and there's more equitable division of behavior or activity with caregivers. Right? So, so you see some parallels between the stuff the caregivers are doing in, in a particular population and what their children are doing. But tons of, of variation um, between um, between populations. Do you have a quick question? Just on this, are there gender parallels? Like, are men in both cultures more or less verbal, or women? Have you noticed anything like that? 
So there, the, the differences between populations are much greater than the um, differences between populations concerning um, things like gender. In fact, the, the Nivon care, uh, fathers are quite attentive um, uh, and engage in, in a huge amount of very high levels of physical contact um, with their kids. I did want to mention, in addition to looking at these differences between populations, we also found really massive effects of education. Now, these were much more um, salient in Vanuatu than in the US. Average education in, in the US is much, much, much higher. Even lower SES parents in the US still have many, many, many more years of formal education than the average um, Nivan adult. But we find that Nivan adults that have um, higher levels of formal education use much more language, astonishingly more language, and engage in a lot more direct instruction than in unschooled um, caregivers. So these methods of communicating information, these sty differences in style are transmitted um, between generations. So we've talked a bit about how, um, how culture is transmitted or how information is transmitted um, and how these practices work and, and how these vary between at least these two populations. What I want to talk to you about next is um, imitation and cultural acquisition strategies, which is what I think imitation is. Now, the capacity to imitate others is integral to the development of human cultural learning. Like, this is how children get a lot of the information that they have. Um, and efficient cultural learning requires flexible imitation. I put this very endearing uh, picture up here to remind you that there are many, many reasons that children imitate others. Right? So one possibility is that this particular, in trying to understand why she is imitating her father, you could think about in kind of an instrumental goal here. Maybe she anticipates having to shave a full beard of whiskers in the future, and so she wants to, to kind of learn a skill. Right? It's probably not the case. Uh, this is probably, I would argue, an affiliative act. Right? One, and a, one core reason that we imitate others is to affiliate with them, and also to learn the social conventions associated with a particular group. And you'll note here, she in fact does not have a razor on her little, um, there's no blade on her razor there. So again, this is no doubt affiliative. But the point is that imitation is multifunctional. Now imitation has been, uh, I wonder, wow, I've never had half the pictures disappear. Um, anyway, they're just lovely pictures of pottery and weaving and things like that. Um, children use imitation to learn instrumental skills. Right? There have been hundreds of studies within developmental psychology focused on imitation um, of instrumental skills. All of these studies really focus on um, understanding physical causality. So if you want to acquire an instrumental skill, you need to know something about the underlying causal infrastructure or, or causal mechanism. A lot of the interest in imitation has come from, in fact, comparative psychology. For a while, imitation was a candidate for human uniqueness. Only um, humans imitate, apes emulate. I know that debate has moved in a variety of different directions, but a lot of the early interest in this topic came from comparative psychology, including a um, very kind of interesting behavior that has been documented um, and studied in both chimpanzees, actually chimps and um, I think at least one other species of primate, um, and human children. And what this, what over-imitation has, um, uh, or just to briefly describe what it is, it's high fidelity imitation, but the use of this particular term involves not just imitating with high fidelity, but imitating behavior that is causally irrelevant to achieving an outcome. So it's imitating both causally relevant behavior and causally irrelevant behavior. And what the comparative literature has shown, at least the few studies that exist on this particular topic, is that children imitate everything. They'll imitate causally relevant and irrelevant behavior. Uh, that chimpanzees will just imitate the causally relevant behavior. So a big puzzle, why would children imitate with high fidelity? Why would they imitate this causally irrelevant behavior when they know full well it's not necessary? Um, well, one possibility, or one reason, that children might engage in high fidelity copying, um, it's not that it's an error in causal reasoning in some way. Um, it might be an adaptive strategy that is employed um, at the expense of efficiency. If you don't know much about a causal system, if this is new, a new task for you, it makes sense to imitate everything. And then once you have more information about the underlying mechanism, you can refine, you can omit, you can streamline. But for a novice learner, high fidelity imitation is a perfectly efficient and reasonable thing to do, um, thus the copying when uncertain. 
Another reason that overimitation has been such a puzzle is that we know, in fact, that young children are really quite precocious and sophisticated causal reasoners. They know a lot about physical causality um, and biological causality, um, social causality, in fact. They're very interested in, in causality. So this is this kind of interesting case of a young organism, a juvenile organism, engaging in behavior that it knows is not causally relevant, right? If this can't possibly be a kind of ignorance account, there must be some other way to explain over imitation. And in fact, if you look around at human behavior, which despite the fact that I'm a psychologist, I still really like to do, I think because I was trained in anthropology, um, a vast amount of behavior that we seek to understand, that we seek to learn, to participate in, is in fact opaque from the perspective of physical causality. A lot of our, for example, social conventions, our rituals, have very, very little to do with physical causality, if anything at all, and is much more about uh, a mechanism of social coordination, cooperation, um, cohesion, things like that. Right? So a lot of what children are imitating it's not instrumental. It's not about physical causality. Um, I think it's about affiliation. So a big part of my empirical research program in recent years is trying to understand how children use imitation for lots of different goals, lots of different functions. In addition to using imitation to learn instrumental skills, they also use imitation to learn rituals. Now, as a cognitive scientist, I'm defining rituals as causally opaque. And by causally, I mean physically causally opaque socially stipulated group conventions. Um, so people will sometimes ask, like, oh, I have, you know, I have my own rituals. I brush my teeth before I have breakfast, and then I do this, that, and the other. I would categorize that as personal habit. That is something different than socially stipulated and shared group behaviors. Um, the extent to which these are psychologically related or not, I think, is an open question. Perhaps the, this, the similarities are more superficial. Perhaps they're more deep, but it's something that more of us should study. I think that affiliation with social groups is what's motivating imitative fidelity or high levels of imitative fidelity in the context of rituals or social conventions. Um, and I think we have a bit of evidence that children, in fact, do imitate rituals primarily for affiliative reasons. We know that ritual has social functions. Um, my uh, most recent postdoc and I have written a couple of papers about this. Um, there's a very rich evolutionary anthropology literature on exactly this topic. Um, we know that living in large groups has introduced all sorts of adaptive problems. You need to coordinate group members for collective action. You need to minimize free riders. You need to increase group commitment to joint goals, uh, prevent defection to rival groups. Um, rituals, I think, provide solutions to a lot of these um, adaptive problems of group living. Uh, rituals are really, really great ways to designate in-group members and to identify in group members. It's a group specific and special knowledge um, that is hard to fake in many cases. Uh, they also are very salient ways to demonstrate your commitment to groups. If you think about a lot of high intensity, painful rituals that characterize many human cultures, um, you think about the fraternity scene. Right? Why is it so essential to publicly suffer? Right? What's, what, could po what, what sane person would ever do such a thing? Um, yet, if you do it collectively together, this in fact, rather than alienating you from a group, which is the effect it would have on me, this in fact draws people, people closer together. Fraternities donate a lot of money, it turns out, despite the fact that they go through periods of bizarre torture as initiation rituals. So rituals do lots of useful things from a social functional perspective. They identify group members. They coordinate behavior. They increase group cohesion. Um, they also promote high fidelity cultural transmission, which is something I'm, I'm quite interested in. So I think the social stipulation and the causal opacity, both of those features of the definition of ritual are really important. They make rituals ideally suited to high fidelity cultural transmission. They also inhibit individual level innovation. Um, and so what we, you see here is a, um, a picture from Samoa. And there's a ceremonial beverage being prepared. Uh, this beverage does, many aspects of the preparation are instrumental and are directly causally related to producing the ceremonial beverage. But there are lots of features of this ceremony that have very, very little indeed, uh, to do indeed with um, actually producing the beverage. Um, different aspects of who participates, what her 
statuses, in terms of her virginity, many, many, many um, social stipulations that have nothing to do with an instrumental outcome. And you see these behaviors are transmitted with very, very high fidelity over time, both within generations and across them. So they transmit high fidelity social convention, they, they transmit behavior with high fidelity um, intergenerationally, not just, again, within the same generation. Now, social cognitive development is um, really at center stage in understanding the evolution of the human mind. We know it develops very, very early in ontogeny. Even infants expect group members to act similarly. Um, they're more likely to imitate in-group members than out-group members. Uh, just putting children in arbitrary groups increases in-group preferences. That's true actually for children. That is also true for adults. I think if we're looking for a candidate for human uniqueness, I think this is where homo ritualis is where, where it's at. Um, there is a deep psychological motivation to reproduce the behavior of others in your environment, your caretakers, your kin, your in-group members, behavior that has, I think you would agree, very little to do with physical causality indeed. So we've studied ritual experimentally in the context of children's social groups, and we've shown that rituals increase children's in-group preferences above and beyond just being in a group. So rituals have an additive effect in increasing in-group preference. Um, and we know that if you look at children in the context of social groups, if they are in these in-groups for a prolonged period of time, they spontaneously create their own conventions and enforce them when other people, um, group members, try to defect. We also know that um, there's a deep connection between social exclusion and imitative fidelity. And we published a paper in, in Psych Science last year demonstrating that children who experienced in-group ostracism, in fact, imitate the behavior of in-group members with higher fidelity than children who were ostracized from an out-group member or children that weren't ostracized at all. Um, also, in-group ostracism is associated with by far the most anxiety um, and a desire for re-inclusion. Right? So imitative fidelity, I think, in many cases is a re-inclusion behavior um, and a sign of affiliation. So this, the, the reason I bring up the instrumental skills versus cultural conventions or rituals, I think the unique demands of acquiring instrumental skills and rituals provides insight into when children imitate with high fidelity, when they innovate, and to what degree. I think flexible social learning, or understanding flexible social learning, requires thinking about instrumental skills and rituals as distinct and broad categories of human um, behavior. So with instrumental learning, we found is that with an increase in experience, imitative fidelity decreases and innovation or behavioral variability increases. In the context of rituals, imitative fidelity stays high. Critically, regardless of experience, an innovation stays low. Uh, so you think about religious ceremonies that you've attended. No matter how many times you've attended these ceremonies, it's never appropriate to add your own individual flair and introduce a little bit of innovation. I would know I've sat through many years of Catholic Mass and attempted similar things with very little luck. Never, none of, none of my innovations ever caught on. I don't know why. Clearly lacking in prestige and status. Okay, so how do children determine when a behavior is an instrumental skill or an instrumental task versus a ritual? This is not as trivial as you might think. For example, if I were to light a candle right now, how would you know whether this had an instrumental goal or a conventional ritual goal? How would you know? How could you tell? One possibility is that I might have some insight knowledge of an eclipse, the power being cut, and I was, you know, had advance warning and I was going to make sure we could, uh, I could illuminate the room for all of you. Another possibility is that I was planning to lead you all through some kind of ancestor worship, which if you know about another topic that I study, that would not be entirely implausible. Uh, so children use social and contextual information to determine whether a behavior is instrumental or ritual. Often you cannot tell just by observing the behavior alone, like the candle example. So we know that children use language in order to determine if something is more instrumental versus more conventional. So something like, I'm doing it for this reason versus this is how we all do it, right? One is instrumental, one is conventional. Cues to consensus matter enormously. So if you show a child a single actor engaging in a behavior twice, imitative fidelity is much lower than if you show them show two different people engaging in the same behavior. Presumably, consensus is a cue to conventionality. 
Um, synchrony matters enormously. Biggest impact of any cue. If you show two people engaging in the same behavior at the same time, imitative fidelity is three times higher than if you just show one person imitating an action sequence. So synchrony is a very powerful example of behavioral coordination and has a massive impact on imitative fidelity. And we've shown this in a number of different papers. Um, it's also been replicated outside of my lab quite a few times. Now, all of these studies, most of these studies have been done in weird populations. Right? What kind of cross-cultural psychologist would I be if I documented this only in Austin, Texas? So we've done similar studies, imitation tasks in Vanuatu as well. We know that children in the US and Vanuatu um, imitate ritual tasks with higher fidelity than instrumental tasks. So when I talk about like an, an imitation task, we do simple things like necklace stringing. And these necklaces involve instrumental behaviors like stringing uh, beads on a necklace, as well as some ritualistic elements like touching the bead to the forehead and doing things like this. And we look to see, based on varying social and contextual information, whether imitative fidelity varies. So we find is that children in Vanuatu also make this distinction between instrumental and ritual tasks. And they imitate ritual tasks with higher fidelity. However, we find higher overall imitative fidelity in Vanuatu. Um, one possibility is that this could be due to cultural variation and expectations for conformity, which is what I want to talk with you about next. So one of the things that, I, um, that makes me very happy um, and, and fills me with a lot of intellectual passion is shamelessly borrowing from the methodologies of many adjacent disciplines. So I use a lot of multivocal ethnography in my work because it's amazing and I highly recommend that you do this. It's very, there's lots of different ways that you can use multivocal ethnography. We have modified it to kind of fuse it with experimental psychological methods. But it basically involves showing videos of a behavior uh, or some target behavior of interest to multiple populations and asking them to explain it. Um, and Tobin did a lot of this earlier work. If you haven't read Preschool in Three Cultures, you absolutely should, because maybe many of you have. But it's just amazing. Um, example of, of the power of multivocal ethnography. So what we did here is we showed ch adults in the US and Vanuatu videos of a target behavior of interest. It was a necklace making task. Um, we had an adult in each cultural context demonstrate this task. And then we had two videos of children from those same communities. One engaged in high fidelity imitation, one engaged in low fidelity imitation. This was between subjects design. Um, so we had adults in the US watch an all, all Nevon videos and all US videos. And after seeing those two videos of a high versus a low fidelity child, we asked the adults, which one of these children do you think is smarter? And which one of these children do you think is more well behaved? So just a little bit more information about the design. So here's our adult demonstrator demonstrating the necklace making task. And then there are two videos, high conformity, low conformity. Um, in Vanuatu and the US. So here's what we find. This is by far the most interesting little thing, um, a little bar here. US adults have a non-conformity bias or associate low levels of conformity with intelligence. So you ask US adults to evaluate US children which of these kids is smarter, high versus low conformity? They go with a low, and by the way, we don't label them as low conformity. Right? It's just a child who introduced more variation into their necklace making task. Um, US adults, uh, by the way, there's a huge SES effect here. The, most, the, the population with the highest non-conformity bias are you, all of you. Graduate school educated US adults have a strong bias here. Um, note, in Vanuatu, it's just the opposite. There's a conformity bias. And critically, we, not, we didn't just have their judgments, we had their explanations. So we asked, we asked adult participants to explain their, their judgment. What do you think the US adult said for choosing that non-conformity child? I mean, what's that? They're creative, they're future leaders, which is quite amazing, given that this is like, <laughs> wow, talk about, that's what I mean also about the kind of praise in these tasks. It's like really giving that child a lot of credit. Um, Future innovators, um, future tech executives. I got a few of those explanations in, in Austin. Um, one interesting thing you'll note is that evaluations for good behavior don't show cultural differences. So there's definitely a conformity bias there. Which of these kids is probably most well behaved? They would go with the highest conformity child. Um, you'll note here, though, when they're asked to evaluate, th these biases are strongest when they evaluate children from their own group. 
so adults evaluating other US kids. Um, there's less, much less of that clear bias for adults evaluating Nevon children. Um, so even how high fidelity imitation is evaluated, what people think it illustrates about your competency, varies enormously across cultures. But the plot thickens, because we also did this study with children and adolescents. So they watched the same videos the adults did. I will say this is an example of a study that did not confirm our predictions. So it's good to show some of those. I sometimes worry when people give talks, they give the impression that they knew absolutely everything, how everything was going to turn out in advance. Because, I mean, why are any of us doing research if we already knew that? Um, we were expecting, what you'll see here, is that US children and adolescents have a very strong conformity bias for intelligence and for good behavior. If anything, our Nevon popula population of children and adolescents is less conformity oriented. Right? So how do we explain this? Massive disconnect. Not a function of small sample size. Right? We have highly variable, large sample sizes. Why aren't we getting? And with US adolescents, isn't this a population that's kind of notorious for being non-conformist? Innovative? Clearly, the US you know, adolescents and children are not picking up on these cultural narratives emphasizing creativity and innovation. Like, how do you explain that? Like, tell me, because I like the reviewers <laughs> want to know. I think it's because in, in schools that's kind of what we are told. Yes. You know, there's one right answer and you are supposed to exactly. and if you get these results, you are smart. So, you know That's right. You see we don't socialize the kind of behavior that we claim we want children to engage in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and in fact, there are really interesting studies using a multivocal ethnography of, kind of different sorts in, um, in educational psychology that document similar findings. That when children watch other children in classrooms engage in behaviors that are more innovative or lower in conformity, children are very critical of that, in fact. So there's cultural variation in beliefs about conformity, creativity, and competence. Um, creativity is strongly associated with intelligence, especially among high SES populations in the US. And in Tanavanawatu, conformity is associated with intelligence. And keep in mind, they're not giving obedience explanations here. They're pointing out that imitating the behavior of another with high levels of fidelity requires a lot of intelligence and cognitive resources. That it's, it's, a, it's very much a cognitive sophistication account. This is not a kind of blind obedience account um, at all. So the behavioral differences um, that we find between instrumental and ritual learning go way beyond imitative fidelity. So we know imitative fidelity is much higher when children interpret a task as a ritual than an instrumental task. Um, we also know we find the opposite thing for innovation. Innovation is much more frequent in the context of an instrumental task, especially a familiar one much lower in a ritual task. We also know that children are much more accurate in detecting differences between multiple actors of a ritual than in an instrumental task, presumably due to expectations for conformity. We've looked at this in the context of parent and, or sorry, uh, peer and parent transmission. We find the same things. Peers transmit behavior with lower fidelity when it's an instrumental task than when it is a ritual task. And so do parents. I'll show you a video of that next. We also find that functional fixedness is lower for instrumental tasks than for ritual tasks. So if you've used objects in the context of a ritualistic task, you are much less likely to be able to use that same object in a creative um, and novel uh, way. So here's a child in our uh, ritual conditions, teaching the task to appear, which in the US, a puppet completely counts as a peer. I didn't know that kids took puppets seriously until I tried this, and US children absolutely do. So this is an example of one of these tasks. So it's her goal to teach the task to the Bobo the bear. We've had about five Bobos because some of the kids walk home with Bobo after the task. they like, big fan, right? Look at the kind of perspective taking in here. All right, so it puts the string on the, this, um, this kind of beads, or the string stretching is one of the causally irrelevant actions. So she reproduces that. One of the things is modeled is touching a bead to your forehead. Note she touches it to the puppet's forehead and not her own. 
Speaking of gender differences, one consistent gender difference we find in this study is that in the US, uh, female children are much more attentive teachers than male children. In fact, usually when the male children are, they will model the task, perhaps within the visual range of the learner, perhaps not. Um, they'll kind of do it and be like, you got that? Cool. Um, whereas female children do much more of this kind of socially attentive teaching. This is a parent-child dyad. You notice he's exactly like she did. We never said any such thing. Right? He interpreted this as um, mandatory high fidelity transmission. Future of American science education, my friends. He's actually an engineer for Dell. Right. The, the point is, I mean, a, a portion of human activity is about technical instrumental skills, and a portion of it is about learning conventions. And this is what he is transmitting. So just an interim summary, I have other, one other thing I want to mention briefly uh, about chimpanzees. So theories of social learning need to capture cultural variation in child socialization practices. I hope I've convinced you of that. Uh, there's enormous variation in input that exists even you know, starting in infancy. The ontogeny of ritual learning or conventional learning, I think, sheds new light on social group cognition and behavior, um, provides a lot of new information about affiliation. And efficient cultural learning requires using imitation and innovation flexibly. I think this distinction between instrumental skills and rituals provides really critical insight into how children navigate this as flexible social learners. So just briefly, one of the things I really wanted to understand is what drives high fidelity imitation? Um, to what extent is this shared with, um, uh, with other primates? And so I'm doing a project that looks at cross-cultural and cross-species variation in, um, in behavioral flexibility. Right? So how do we explain the lack of over-imitation in chimps and the presence of over-imitation in human children? Now, if you want to understand cumulative culture and the fact that cultural insights in humans are accumulated and um, transmitted and modified over generations, I mean, that's how we explain the complexity of human culture. That's what makes us unique. We're not recreating all of our technological sophistication within a generation. You need to look at social learning, which here, learning, uh, social learning I'm defining very simply as learning based on observation of or interaction with another animal or its products. Um, as I mentioned, cumulative culture is the ability to build upon or ratchet up on behavior. Uh, so if we want to understand cultural complexity, we need to figure out how ch human children are able to do this. Now, socially learned behaviors are common across many animal taxa. We know that. Um, but cumulative culture is limited or absent in uh, non-human animals. Curious about how do we explain that. And there are really striking differences in cultural complexity between humans and other primates. In this context, I'm comparing humans to chimpanzees. Um, I started working with the, the captive chimpanzee population in Bastrop, which is about 40 miles outside of, of Austin. We know that chimpanzees exhibit the greatest number of traditions other than humans. I think we know that. I work with chimpanzee people, so they, people like Andy White and Claim, you can let me know if that's not true. Is that not true? OK, that's true. OK, cool. That's good. <laughs> um, there's little evidence for the accumulation of um, cultural traditions in chimpanzees. Now, social, there are a lot of different candid candidates to explain this. Various factors may contribute to the relative stasis of chimpanzee culture, um, relevant um, socio-cognitive adaptations, low fidelity social learning mechanisms, um, failure to employ appropriate learning heuristics. So there are many different candidate explanations for this. Um, however, cumulative culture ultimately requires uh, the ability to change established behaviors um, in order to adopt more efficient uh, or more effective or more productive behaviors. And that's really the paradigm we're using in this research. Uh, now, behavioral flexibility, the reason we're interested in that, is that it allows for relinquishing, modifying, and building on prior solutions. So we want to understand chimpanzees' capacity or um, lack of capacity to do this relative to uh, children. Um, and one candidate proposal here is that behavioral inflexibility may limit um, the evolution of culture or might explain the relative stasis of chimpanzee culture. <laughs> 
So defining behavioral flexibility is this continued interest in acquiring new solutions to a task, critically, um, despite having already mastered a solution, right? So this is about having a, a perfectly productive solution and abandoning that in favor of a better one or a more efficient one. Um, this is through innovation or through social learning. So we know the, um, the literature on behavioral conservatism in chimps appears to be at least superficially inconsistent with the literature on um, over-imitation or the lack of over-imitation in chimps. So if, if it is the case that chimps are very um, high in behavioral conservatism, why aren't they over-imitating? Well, it turns out the paradigms used to study over-imitation and behavioral conservatism are often very, very different. Most of the research on over-imitation involves um, causally relevant behaviors and then a few very obviously unrelated behaviors. Chimps don't produce the unrelated ones. They don't imitate those. Um, don't transmit them. The behavioral conservatism tasks typically just model effective but very inefficient solutions. So all of the behaviors are relevant to achieving the outcome. It's just a very inefficient way to do it. Um, and I think that might explain what appears to be superficially um, a kind of inconsistency in the results. So we're interested in trying to understand additive ratcheting versus omission or streamlining um, and explaining the differences between um, chimpanzees' behavior in these different literatures. So two factors might impact behavioral flexibility, um, both practice and complexity. You need to be able to recognize and adopt superior variants um, that are simple um, and similar to existing routines as a first step towards uh, behavioral flexibility. Um, you also need to relinquish old solutions and build on behaviors. So just briefly, this is what the task that we've done looks like. We're interested in understanding the emergence of behavioral flexibility in the developing child. I'm interested in the development of executive functioning, so that's part of the interest, as well as in hominin evolutionary history. This is a picture of our puzzle box that we've used. Um, and, uh, Andy White and his, and his group have created many of these. So a few things to, to note about this. Um, the efficient solution is pulling this little trap door here and extracting a token. That's the efficient solution. The inefficient solution involves um, closing off this efficient extraction point um, and using your finger to push the token along through each of these different compartments and extracting it at the end there. Right? So there's an inefficient and an efficient solution. So we're comparing the ability of three to five-year-old children and adult chimpanzees to relinquish a practiced inefficient solution, which has been modeled by a human experimenter, um, in favor of an observed more efficient strategy. We've also done it the other way around, but I'll just present one of the conditions. So here's the inefficient solution. You can see, hopefully, the chimp doing this. So he's got his finger in there, poking that token along painfully. It takes chimps a long time to learn this. But critically, we made sure that all, there were eight chimps in this particular study, all were at threshold for this behavior. If you want to look at behavioral change, you need to make sure they actually have the target behavior of interest. So they acquire the inefficient solution. Then we teach them the efficient solution. So here, sorry, this, here's the efficient solution. So you see, pulls open that little door, little pincher grip pops that token right out, gets his reward. That is the, um, that requires relinquishing that inefficient solution um, in favor of an efficient one. There was another phase in this study in which if the children or the chimps hadn't already switched at that point, um, we blocked the inefficient solution through a little um, groove in the apparatus, which means that you, you would, and when children or chimps were attempting to use that inefficient method, it would be blocked because the token would get stuck in a groove. Um, this will become very interesting in just a minute because of what children and chimps will do. Um, and if they still don't switch at that point, the efficient method is scaffolded. So here's what we find. This is a box plot showing latency to switch across children three to five, as well as our chimps. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, the chimps are very conservative. It is very difficult to get them to switch to an efficient behavior once they have critically a functional inefficient behavior. Um, they're just a behavioral repertoire that they know works. Um, what's perhaps more interesting is that the developmental story here maps beautifully onto the development of executive functioning and cognitive flexibility from three 
to five. Um, so at least the mean level behavior, mean switch, um, a score of seven would mean that they immediately switch from an inefficient to an efficient solution, like after that first modeling. So the mean um, difference between three and five is clear. What's interesting is this, in this group of three-year-olds, there are a substantial number that do immediately switch. Um, but this could potentially be explained due to um, lower overall levels of imitative fidelity or over-imitation in early childhood. So to wrap up, um, behavioral conservatism in chimps is pretty clear here. They perseverate with a complex solution despite potential gains in efficiency. They have difficulty inhibiting their first learned foraging technique to adopt a novel alternative. There's also quite a bit of perseveration in children, especially the younger children. Um, and there's really high variability in switching behaviors with the kids, much more variation than you see with the chimps, where the median switch scores are consistent with increasing cognitive resources with age. But I want to show you what is most interesting about what children do in these tasks. So what you see here is he uses the efficient method of extraction. He doesn't pull it out. This is phase three, so he moves it out of that groove and then uses the inefficient method. But interestingly, he also does some innovation there. You know if you note the like finger flick technique? <laughs> so the chimps will stick their individual finger in every single one of those holes without fail. Children will, will reproduce the action sequence kind of generally, but they'll do this kind of flick thing so they don't have to flick it in every hole, just a few of the holes. So you see this really interesting example of behavioral combination. So if we think about the evolution and ontogeny of behavioral flexibility, we see limitations in cognitive resources in chimps. The median switch data support developmental increases in cognitive resources. I think that this behavioral combination that we're seeing in children is really interesting. Um, I think it might provide some insight into the psychological foundations of innovation or behavioral um, flexibility, um, behavioral variability as well. So to summarize, as humans, we have a repertoire of cultural transmission practices and acquisition strategies. Um, these vary quite substantially across human populations, well, within and across populations. Teaching reflects parental ethno theories, um, the complexity of the skill to be acquired, um, also the educational institutions that exist within a population. We also know that efficient cultural learning requires using imitation and innovation flexibly. I think the, the best way to study this is to think about different goals of behavior, and the instrumental ritual distinction, I think, is, is a useful one. The ontogeny of ritual learning, I think, will shed new light on social group cognition and behavior, and also provide some insight into the motivation, children's motivation for imitating affiliative behaviors with very high levels of fidelity. And as I just mentioned, behavioral flexibility and combination provide, um, I think, provide the foundation of cumulative culture and support innovation in the case of, of human populations. So studying diversity in cultural learning enriches evolutionary science, enriches psychological science, developmental science. And I hope I've convinced you that the evolution and ontogeny of cultural learning informs our understanding of cognitive and cultural evolution. Acknowledge my wonderful team of postdocs. If this seems like very time intensive data to collect, it is. And I have very talented and wonderful committed people helping me um, do this. And I'm available for questions. Delightful to hear about the stretching of anthropology into psychology and mm -hmm. vice versa. And um, I have been co teaching with Erica Cartmel um, a, a course that uh, tries to do the same, um, focusing on language and Wonderful. human lifespan and lots of other things. Um, and so, I mean, it's, Almost every, I mean, or, you know, so much of what you said so resonates with the language socialization literature, yeah. which is a literature that tries to be Absolutely. a bridge. Um, 
And it's, you know, I, I think, you know, for me, and I just kind of pose this uh, for you, what is a challenge is trying to bring these different dimensions that you mentioned into some kind of complex. Like, how can we understand yeah. these things, how they go together? And, I'm, you know, you talked about so many different dimensions yeah. that it's kind of, you know, very challenging mm -hmm. for the brain, but, I'm, you know, just sitting here trying to, to, to do it. But I was just wondering about um, how, you know, from the get-go, when children are orchestrated to face outward mm -hmm. and to attend to other people, yes. how that then affords many of the other things Great. that you're talking about, like paying attention to people. Yes. Um, also, the, I mean, the some of the experimental evidence about like not asking children questions or not even, you know, not having that talk so much. I mean, allowing children repeated opportunities to look at things, so you have that access that yeah. children, middle class children, here don't have that access, yeah. and so it provides a lot of space, so you don't have to kind of rush and sort of tell everybody everything, right. and blah, 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 blah. And yeah, I think this has a lot of consequences for the Tomasello notion about triadic interaction. Yeah. Why does triadic interaction have to be face-to-face? -face? It doesn't have to be face-to-face -face if a child is nested yeah. and is looking at objects as they're being used and yeah. by the person whose lap they may be, or back, or whatever. Absolutely. You know, so anyway. Yes. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I think you might be, um, you'd be interested in is that this increased orientation towards social observation does have a variety of different consequences for learning. For example, we've done studies with these populations that have um, their imitation tasks that involve an, an, an adult model, modeling some, say, the necklace making task, and then we have a target child. And we tell them, it's your turn, you need to learn this. Um, but then, actually modifying some of the um, experimental paradigms of, of Barbara Rilbach, we have an onlooker child. So a child that is just hanging out, waiting for their turn. We give them a distractor object to potentially do something else. We tell them, it's going to be your turn next. Now, you would think that if it's your, you know that you're going to be asked to do exactly what I've been asked to do, you would just go ahead and watch my, my demonstration, or the, 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 the behavior that was demonstrated for me. What we find in these, ta these cross-cultural tasks is that there's no cultural variation at all in how much the target child learns. So imitative fidelity with that target child where they're overtly being you know, taught, imitative fidelity is the same. It's the imitative fidelity of the onlooker child that varies. So the child that was not the target of attention, and keep in mind, the target child is here, the onlooker child is here. They can see everything. And yet, when we code the imitative fidelity of that onlooker child, and keep in mind, they didn't get a second demonstration, imitative fidelity is much, much, much higher in Vanuatu than the US. So there's enormous variation in how much that onlooker child learns observationally. It's, it's astonishing. You look at middle class kids who are going to these Western schools, I'm sure you could, you could tell me what they're doing. They're sitting there and they're playing with that object. They're looking around, they're picking their nose, they're doing a great variety of different things. Are they watching the behavior of the person next to them? Well, why would they? They've been told it's not their turn. We manage children's attention to such an extraordinary degree. Adults do. This, is, this must have massive consequences for how you orient towards other information. I think this just example of observational learning is just one of many um, enormous potential to, to study these sorts of things. We know relatively little about um, how fundamentally changing children's social environment impacts their psychological development. I want, I want to push you a little bit on your distinction between ritual and instrumental. Um, I like this, this paper's excellent, and I, I think you're on something really important, but I wonder if it presumes too much a kind of knowledge of the physical universe and doesn't think enough about sort of all kinds of symbolic efficiency. So sure. think of religion, people with OCD, children, yeah. Yeah. and you know, so yeah, I have a wedding that didn't go well, or I don't have a wedding at all, 
physically, of course, I'm still married, right? But there's sort of a symbolic way in which it destroys everything, right? It has these sorts sure. of effects I think of as having. And sure, so, sure. and then also, I mean, based on your Catholic background, you know, my uncle who puts his St. Joseph statue buried upside down in his front yard, yeah. right? All these kinds of efficacies yeah. that are thought to have. Sure, and sure. so I think you're right of the sort of Durkheimian tack that things have a kind of, the, the efficacy is a social efficacy, but you know, I also think Weber's right, that a lot of these are rituals that are, are meant to have a physical and sort of symbolic sure. and physical effect. And just along these lines, um, you know, I, I wonder to what to what degree this is also a function of um, sort of gradual expertise. So you can think of Muslims, for example. There's a certain kind of, of Muslim for whom you imitate every possible thing about Muhammad, right? Mm -hmm. And there's other Muslims that would say, look, you don't have to wear, like, you can show your ankles, right? There's all kinds of things where they think it doesn't matter. But there's men who think, I have to look as much like Muhammad as possible. It's better to err on the side of caution. Yeah. And so I wonder if you could just talk about that line and how that line works. Right, so I mean, one of the things I've done is in trying to understand the, the kind of psychological landscape of ritual. First of all, I think that it is, it is insightful to draw a general distinction between instrumental and ritual t um, behavior, sure. provide some empirical traction for studying these things. In lived human behavior, a lot of the things we engage in have instrumental and ritual elements. Right. You know, this is all, it's like a relative distinction. It's not as though I assume there's are there are hard and fast um, categories of purely instrumental versus purely ritual actions. Um, it's also the case that for planning of instrumental tasks, people don't necessarily know the underlying physical causality. Um, so it's. I think these are relative differences and, and impact the degree to which children and adults um, reproduce the behavior with very high levels of fidelity. The fact that we get a whole cascade of behavioral consequences, it's not just imitation, it's also innovation, it's difference detection, it's functional fixedness. Um, all of these sorts of things would suggest that this is a, this is a, meaning, a psychologically meaningful distinction. Um, importantly, I wanted to mention though, I've done quite a bit of research on what I call ritualistic remedies. So there are many, for example, a lot of traditional medicine and healing and superstition, magical healing remedies, are, are rituals that, ha that are intended to have an effect, right? They're not expected to have a, an effect based on a knowable physical causal mechanism. So that, that's one of the reasons why I was kind of going on about physical causality. It's not that I think rituals have no effects and they don't have functions, they do. They have incredibly important social functions. And in some cases, they even have an instrumental function. But it's not based on a, a potentially knowable physical causality. So I've done research on Brazilian simpachias, which are these ritualistic remedies that are used, you can get them from any Brazilian supermarket. And they're used to cure basically any problem you can imagine, from infidelity to unemployment and everything in between, and tuberculosis, and there are these scripts that are totally opaque from the perspective of physical causality. So take a coconut and cut the top off and scoop out the flesh and put in some Tabasco sauce and um, a, 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 the skin of a particular type of mango. So there's tons of procedural detail. There's no mechanism for, how, for understanding how this works. Now clearly people think they work or right. could work. Right. They wouldn't do them if they didn't. So pe humans borrow from all these different categories of, of human behavior to develop solutions to problems. Um, but the underlying, this is where the kind of causal opacity of ritual and the social stipulation of this becomes so important. OK, we're going to have coffee afterwards. So if, if you have more questions, please do join us for coffee.